Hello and good evening. Welcome. My name is Ben Wilder, Director of the Desert Laboratory on Tumamak Hill. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. I hope you are all doing very well um, on what is all of a sudden cool evenings as uh, fall and the change of seasons have, have welcomed us. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Tumamak Hill, known in Atam as Chumamagi Duag, Horn Lizard Mountain, on the ancestral lands of the Sabraipri and Donna Atam peoples. This volcanic hill is a prominent ancestral, cultural, and sacred significance to the Atam nations, including the Donna Atam Nation, Gila River Indian Community, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, the Akchen Indian Community, as well as the Hopi Tribe and the Pasco Yaqui Tribe. The Desert Laboratory recognizes the cultural significance of Chimamagi Duag as the bedrock of our institutions and our, and our future actions. So this fall, we're focusing our lecture series, a four-parted lecture series on Tumamak Hill, health, community, and nature in a new era. I hope that many of you are able to join us for our first installment last month um, when we began to really touch into a lot of the themes that we're playing into this series. Um, and, and that was a great overview with Dr. Betsy Cantwell and Dr. Teresa Cullen on, on this, the role that the Hill plays um, in the community uh, through time, but especially in times of change. And so that's really where this lecture series focuses is trying to understand um, kind of the connection between people and space, but really looking at it's kind of how, what's that role that the Hill plays and continues to play in the lives of so many since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and one thing that we've seen as kind of a manager and steward of this space is that the number of people that are visiting the space really did not fluctuate much at all during the past 18 months. And if anything, numbers at certain times of the year went up. Um, and that continued use of over a thousand people a day in this uh, landscape uh, really speaks to that connection held between people and space, this space in particular, and then the larger role of community health and nature in current times. And so kind of when, what's the next era, what I'm referring to in the lecture series. And what I really mean in this new era is talking about an age of uncertainty. Um, that uncertainty driven by the pandemic, you know, consist constant shifting trends, looking at numbers, caseloads, the variants, ability to meet in person or not. Um, uncertainty driven by climate change and climate extremes. Um, and then also uncertainty driven by great polarization our, our uh, society continues to, to experience. And so th this next era is all of these pieces, so much tumultuous change happening around us, but trying to find anchor points, right? Core elements of um, grounding, I would say for us. And, and I think they're really relevant themes about how we individually, collectively, interact with this particular space, uh, Tumamak Hill or Tumamak, uh, the Horned Lizard Mountain, and that so much can be learned here from the confluence of culture, science, and community on these slopes. Um, there's an enrichment that happens here when one is here, and, and that is so needed as we continue to progress in this age of uncertainty. So this evening, I'm very honored uh, uh, to be able to welcome to be joined by our speaker, Chairman Ned Norris, Jr. Uh, back in the spring, when I was thinking about this fall's lecture series, I was reflecting on the kind of the continued and repeated use of the, of the hill that I see by many people. And, uh, and I, I've seen Chairman Norris spending lots of time here walking up and down the hill um, for the recent months. And I was really hoping he was one of the people that could speak with us. As, as I walked down the hill that evening in the spring, I ran into Chairman Norris walking up. Um, stopped his moment, upward momentum and eagerly invited him to be part of this series. And he kindly said yes. And uh, I'm now many months afterwards, I'm very uh, honored and, and pleased to be able to welcome uh, Chairman Norris. So Chairman, uh, feel free to turn your video on for the brief bit and thank you for being here. <clears throat> Ned Norris Jr. is an, an enrolled member of the Donna Nation 
from the remote village of Fresno Canyon and the Bobby Kibri district. He was elected to a, a four-year term as the chairman of the Donatham Nation in May of 2019, and previously served two four-year terms as chairman from 2007 to 2015, and was vice chairman from 2003 to 2007. He has also previously held multiple managerial positions as the Donatum Gaming Enterprise, most recently as Director of Governmental Relations. Dr. Norris has served the people of his nation for more than four decades. In addition to working with the enterprise and holding the position of Chairman and Vice Chairman, he has also served as the Assistant Director of the Tribe's Children home, Children's Home, Court Advocate, Children's Court Judge, Court of Appeals Judge, Indian Child Welfare Specialist, Assistant Director of Tribal Social Services, Director of Tribal Government Operations, and Chief Judge of the Nation's Judicial Branch. That's a lot of different hats, um, very important each one of them. He has served on the boards of numerous tribal, civic, and community organizations. In May 2009, Dr. Norris was conferred an honorary doctorate degree of human letters from the University of Arizona. Um, so Chairman, we're going to start this evening with a, with a video that, um, that you've shared with us. And so we'll go to that now, and then I'll welcome you. You kind of come back on to the screen, um, share some remarks with us. And then I think we're going to get into you know, a conversation, go back and forth. Um, I've got a lot of questions I'm eager to ask you. And then we'll get to a point in the evening where um, we'll be able to field questions from the audience. So anybody that has any questions you would like to um, ask of Chairman Norris, please put them in the question and answer um, icon box you see there. You can type those in. We'll be receiving them, and then I'll, I'll hope to be able to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, and we will be concluding this evening's uh, session and presentation no later than 7.30. So thank you for joining us, and we'll go to the video now, and then we'll have you back and join us in a second, Chairman. Thank you, Ben. Thank you uh, to the University of Arizona and uh, Desert Laboratory and uh, Chumamuk Hill. It's an honor to be here with you this evening. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for asking me to do this. Thank you for this opportunity. You know, I, uh, I opened uh, with that particular song and with the, the photos that um, were going um, through throughout the song. Um, the song itself is a song about uh, our sacred mountain, uh, Babakibri Peak, or Waukir Tuak. And um, uh, that song, or that, that hill, that mountain is, is sacred to, um, to the author. Uh, we believe that our creator, Iithoi, uh, dwells in that, in that hill. And there is an area on, on, on top of the the, some of the areas in the in the hill, in that mountain that uh, we believe our our as I said our Creator dwells, but also there's a cave up there where many of our autumn go to to offer um, thanks to all to pray to ask Creator for for help or for healing, uh, maybe family, maybe a friend, maybe whatever the case may be. But I also um, put in the photos, uh, photos of uh, Quito Bequito Springs um, down uh, um, near uh, uh, Sean or, or Sonoita uh, at the Mexico border. 
Um, and that spring has a very significance to, to the autumn, uh, primarily the Hiachar autumn, but uh, it has significance to us that many times folks will go to the springs for for the same reason, blessings, for prayer, for thanks, for for uh, um, uh, prayer, for healing, for family members, or whatever the case may be. And then the third set of photos that, that I included in there uh, was the uh, an area down near, near uh, Puerto Penasco. Um, and that area is uh, where there are some salt flats and, and it's right near the ocean. And uh, just to share with the audience that, uh, you know, these areas and Chumamak is, is, isn't any uh, different than these areas, but these areas play a very significant role in, in, in who we are as, as all of them, uh, who we are as a people. And they are areas that we feel very strongly about because these are areas where our ancestors, the ancestors of our people being the Hohokam, that our, our, our ancestors have lived in this area since time immemorial. And uh, with regards to the, the ocean and the, uh, the salt areas, uh, over centuries, over generations of, of, of of all of them have traveled, have done pilgrimages to the salt area, to uh, the ocean. And uh, they would uh, go to the ocean and they would sing to the ocean. They would make, give offerings to the ocean. They would uh, pray to the ocean. They would ask the ocean to, to give them strength, to give them healing, to give their, maybe their families healing or or things that are going on within their within their family or with their friendships that that need prayer that need blessing, and then uh, uh, with regards to the salt area, you know historically because this is near the ocean area historically, our our ancestors and and all of them would go to the salt area because that area was again sacred to us. And the salt had very significant meaning to us as a people. In addition to that, um, we uh, also gathered the salt for our ancestors and our, our all of them gathered the salt for trade in the Tucson area when Tucson was just beginning to, to establish itself, um, as well as the, the shells from the ocean would be gathered and shell necklaces would be made in order to uh, uh, use them for trade as well with, uh, with folks in the city in what was then Tucson uh, or Stokshan as, as, as we call it. Um, and so it's, it's important you know, to, to recognize that you know, these are just a, a few, you know, two or three examples of, of um, what would we, we would consider um, uh, sacred or what we would consider areas that we go to for, for prayer, uh, for healing, uh, for um, asking or for even thanks or thank good things that may have happened to, uh, to, to someone or to a family and so on and so forth. And so um, I also wanted to acknowledge the fact and, and Ben commented earlier in his opening remarks that uh, you know, this, this, this area that we call Chumamak, uh, Chumamak Doak or Chumamak Thong is an area that, that has played a very significant role in, 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 uh, with our ancestors, the, the whole come and, and, and with the all of them. And just to say that, you know, there are, we have sister tribes that are, are, are all of them. We have, uh, we all, believe that uh, we are descendants of the Hohokam, that being the, the Akamir Autumn or the river Autumn, meaning the, the Gila River uh, people, uh, the Salt River people, uh, the Akchin Maricopa Autumn, and the Hiachar Autumn. We are, all, we are all sister tribes. We are sisters with each other. We all share um, uh, uh, cultural uh, issues, we, we share 
uh, common language. We may have just different uh, dialects that uh, uh, each of the all of them uh, uh, folks may have, but uh, uh, we we consider ourselves uh, 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 sister sister tribes, and and we we treat each other that way. You know when when you know my actually my my middle daughter had had really opened my eyes to the idea of starting this. Uh, um, this climb up, uh, up Chimamat. And uh, that probably happened, I don't know, maybe in 2015, 2016. Uh, it was on, on Father's Day, I remember. She had asked me if I would, if I would walk up Chimamat with her. I said, sure, you know, shouldn't be a problem. Um, and so I did. And, and since that time, uh, you know, I have been pretty consistent with, uh, uh, with walking up, uh, up the hill. Um, and, you know, because I find it very uh, uh, soothing, uh, very relaxing, um, and, and it's a time, it's an opportunity for uh, me to prepare myself mentally, say, for the day or for the week or you know, whatever the case may be. It may prepare myself to uh, prepare my, myself spiritually and mentally to uh, prepare something that I might, the challenge, a challenge that I might have going on on, on any one particular day. Um, and so for me, uh, not only has, has my uh, experience and my commitment to uh, walking up uh, Chimamat been um, an opportunity to, to exercise and to uh, work on my own physical being and my own physical health um, because it has had a definite impact on, on, uh, on, on my health in a positive way. Um, but it's also, as many of you know, if you've been up there, if you've had that walk, you, you will know that uh, it's a very, uh, it's a, if you want a, a good cardiac, uh, cardio workout, then Chimamak is uh, is the exercise for you to do, um, and so that was uh, another reason why I would uh, spend time in 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 uh, going up uh, up the Chimamak Hill, is because I, I I just felt that it was an opportunity to work on my own physical being, my own physical health, my own uh, weight control, and and so on and so forth, and. Um, at the same time, an opportunity for me to um, to evolve spiritually, to be able to uh, take that opportunity to think about uh, the significance of that area and what that area meant to um, to our ancestors, to to um, uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, during the time that they lived, that they lived there, um, you know, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of whole um, history uh, about the hill that has been researched, that has been written, that has been identified uh, in that area and on the top of the hill with uh, a a whole um, you know village uh, being one of the the living areas for for our ancestors, um, and so it's. Uh, uh, um, not only, like I said, an opportunity to get a good workout, but it's an opportunity to um, to just think about our ancestors. And you know, many times, in fact, almost I was just up there this morning. Um, you know, it was, it's getting pretty cold. I, I started out at about six o'clock this morning, and it was uh, I don't know, just about forty degrees or so. Um, but you know, it's uh, I'll, I'll I'll walk up there and I'll I'll you know, do what I need to do, and you know, just uh, at times you you the, the 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 what you see sometimes is is so so amazing. You know, I was up there uh, last Friday when I was walking up there. I ran into a couple of uh, um, pretty good sized bucks. Uh, I I rarely ever see a buck on on walking up the hill. I see a lot of does quite a bit, um, but I saw a couple of bucks this time and. 
And a lot of times when we see things like that as all of them as natives and we see things like that, we, uh, we see that as a blessing that the creator has just blessed us with the opportunity to witness, to experience that, uh, that wildlife in their own, in their own environment. Um, so not only is it, like I said, cardio uh, exercise and, and spiritual, but uh, also there's a lot of um, nature um, that, you, that you run into in going up that hill. Uh, almost always when I when I do reach the top after after this many years doing it, I still gasp. I'm gasping for air when I get to the top, but uh, not as bad as when I was when I first started. Um, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and I'll uh, I have a particular rock that I sit on and I'll I'll just uh, listen to nothing. You know, the wind or the the nature or the birds that are are chirping in in the background. Uh, or, you know, I'll just sit there and, and maybe just think about family, think about friends, think about uh, somebody that, that may need uh, some, some, some help and prayer in some way or some good thoughts. And, and you know, for me, me, it's more than just a workout. It's, 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 uh, it's a connection to that place as a way to heal myself and take this opportunity to possibly even heal others as um, we may pray or I may pray for, for others that, that, that may need it. So, you know, I, I really do uh, look at it as, as, a, as an opportunity to, to strengthen, to strengthen myself spiritually, to strengthen myself emotionally, to strengthen myself uh, mentally, in addition to the physical um, uh, benefits of, of walking uh, Chumamak. Um, you know, and I don't know how many other folks see, see, that, see it that way, um, but you know, for me, I, I was, it's an honor for me to be able to share uh, my, this experience with you and share with you some of the reasons why um, I, I, I go there. Um, because you know, for me, not only do you, do you do do I spend time just reflecting and thinking thoughts and praying and 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 taking all the spiritual spiritualness of it and the culturalness of it, but you can if if you can really feel what the strength of that mountain, um, I feel it. I can feel the strength of that mountain. I can feel the strength of of our of our ancestors. Uh, that have lived there since, uh, you know, way before any of us have lived here. And you can just feel the power of that mountain, or I can feel the power of that mountain. Uh, so for me, that is, uh, that is a healing place. That is a place to connect, to um, uh, connect and, and the opportunity uh, to, to heal. So with that, you know, I, I just want to again thank you for for the opportunity, Ben. Thank you for for your audience, for this audience that has gotten onto the call here or to the to the video here, and uh, uh, let's let's have some conversation. Fantastic, thank you, Chairman. Thanks for those remarks. Maybe following directly, kind of on the heels of what you're saying, in that that strength that you're able to connect to here, where maybe just reflect on one of the times that that I saw you, maybe the first time I think I saw you on, on the hill was at the top on the um, summer, the sunrise, just after sunrise of the summer solstice in 2020. And that, that I think that particular point in the year, especially that year, um, had just had a lot of reflected strength in it. And it was wonderful to see you at that time. And I'm just kind of curious, how have your experiences, if at all, kind of shifted from pre to post pandemic in terms of the strength or the healing aspects that you're connecting to here? Well, um, you know, obviously with, without, without the pandemic, you know, there was really not, not uh, really didn't think about things like that, didn't worry about kinds of things like that. And, and it was, seemed to be a little bit more, um, you didn't have this, the, the, 
the 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 need to be concerned about uh, social distancing and and the idea that you might you might uh, uh, um, contract the, the 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 virus, you know, on, on this walk. Uh, obviously, now we have to think about those kinds of things, and you know, and when when the pandemic got to its uh, one of its 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 highest points, and uh, the decision to shut down uh, Chimamak, uh, you know, for me, it was it was it was a great loss. It was a great loss because that was my that was my that was where I I I I, I was able to uh, re reinitiate some of the the spiritual or some of the the the, the emotional uh, um, strength uh, that I think you know uh, people have and so it was it was a loss and uh, you know I just uh, uh, just uh, uh, I was glad when we were able to to start going up there again because uh, you know you get to a point where it's like uh, you go to, you go to withdrawals you know it's like oh it's it's six o'clock in the morning I was supposed to be walking up Chumamak you know and and I'm not able to do that. So you, you get to a point where it's like, it's driven in you that you have to do it, it's a must. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been there and I continue to be there. And so I hope that, um, that the pandemic, obviously we still have to be concerned about the pandemic. We have to be concerned about, about the, the virus. A lot of folks think, well, well, the virus is gone. It's gone away. It has not gone away. And, and we need to be concerned about that. So thank you. I, I really appreciate that reflection. And it's such an important thing for me to hear as the steward and the manager of this space. And, you know, we didn't make that decision lightly. And, but they just, it, you know, as a laboratory, right? A lot of times it can be thinking about the operations here at the Hill and, and our scientific uh, endeavors, but and what I'm connecting to more and more and more is the, the connection for the community and just the ripple effects of um, that has for at the individual and then really at the community level for us of not being able for so many people where this is an anchor, this is a grounding space and to not have that it's just um well anyway it, it it's felt it, you just described on that personal level but also that multiplied by so many so I'm so glad we were able to re open that connection, you know, kind of think on the similar train of thought. So in our first presentation of this series, we had, I had the opportunity to speak with, um, you know, our University of Arizona and Pima County leaders and Dr. Betsy Campbell and Dr. Terry Cullen about they, how they were addressing this time of uncertainty uh, as leaders. And I'm very curious and for, to know, you know, what have been your guiding principles and perhaps new perspectives gained um, in leading your people through such a harrowing time. And th these last months have not just been, you know, um, kind of predominated by the pandemic. The border wall was created on, on through your lands during this time as well. The, 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 the challenges you've had to face have been horrendous. And I'm just curious what, as a leader through your, for your people for so long now, um, what is what have, has been kind of your guiding principles in this time? Oh, well, um, you know, we have, uh, we, the autumn, have been in this area since time immemorial. We have faced many challenges in our, during our ancestral life, as well as our current life. You know, we 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 are strong as a people. We 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 have a a positive outlook that you know this we're going to get through this pandemic as well. You know, it's it's going to be a challenge. It has been a challenge, but you know, um, our generations of, of ancestors, our generations of all of them, have had many 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 challenges, and to be able to just keep that instilled in your own mind and recognize that you know we have to the time has times have changed we this pandemic has really had a has really changed a, a significant way of how we live as a people 
how we think as a people, how we treat our deceased as a people, uh, how we mourn as a people. It's, it's had such a, a significant impact on, on our life as a people. But, you know, we have to continue to acknowledge that we're going to get through this. We are strong. We are vibrant. We are resilient. We are, we, you know, we are a people that have to come together, that have to support each other. You know, and, and, and you know, when that border wall was, was being constructed without any consultation to, to the Thonaut the nation's leadership and, and uh, uh, as many times as we try to uh, to impress on on the the customs and border protection, the homeland security folks, the the previous uh, uh, president of of the United States, that there were significant archaeological and significant areas that were sacred to the autumn in in the footprint of of that. Um, uh, of that uh, border wall, um, you know, it was, it's unfortunate that, that many times um, our words fell on deaf ears and that many times, you know, what we witnessed was a desecration of a holy area. Uh, and, and one time in a, in a congressional hearing, I, I, I equaled the, the, the situation to of what the border patrol was doing to when they 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 put dynamite and 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 and, and exploded uh, the to make way for for the road and the border wall, um, I equated that to, and I say this because we had already told the border patrol we had documented proof that that area there was a fairly significant area where there were burial sites in that in that footprint and uh, I equated that that destruction that desecration to in a congressional hearing to um, running a bulldozer to through Arlington Cemetery mm -hmm. you know if you can imagine running a bulldozer through Arlington Cemetery if you can imagine that if you can feel how that would feel um, uh, as a non-author, um, that's the same feeling we get when we saw what was going on along the, the, the border. And so, you know, they're, they're you know, I, I, I just, uh, some of the, the, the principles is, is you know, just remember and talk to the elders and remember, you know, who we are as a people and that we have to, we have to help each other. We have to support each other. We have to maintain our strength as a people to know that eventually we're going to get through this, but we can't do it alone. We are all in this together and we're gonna get through it at some point. Absolutely, you know, one of the things that I've felt in the last couple of years is that, um, I'm just thinking as a community of um, collaborators, friends, partners, in the larger Sonoran Desert region, that we've been hit, um, I feel like, by a one-two punch of, you know, a pandemic not allowing us to come together in person, and then the right hand of the further fragmentation of our region by this border wall, and it, and it's it's kind of set a narrative at a lot of times that it feels just um, completely at odds with the fundamental fabric of our region and all the strengths we have. And so your words to just remember the resiliency, to remember the long-term perspective. And um, and then I'm also thinking about these grounding spaces, you know, like we're talking about tonight of Chumamak and again, just having that, you know, those pillars that can provide us the strength. Um, you know, think kind of related to that and zooming out a little bit but on the same theme, when we're thinking and you talk about and think about autumn um, healing spaces in general, you know what characteristics do these spaces have, um, either physical, geographical, or, or spiritual? And then kind of what elements of such places, of such spaces are, are present on uh, Chumabak? Hmm. Well, um, 
sometimes I wonder when I when I um, either am told or read about or actually visit a um, an area that has um, cultural um, spiritual significance to to our people. Um, sometimes I wonder why here, why this area, what was going on through our ancestors' minds that that gave reason to that particular spot or that particular area for that purpose. And uh, I haven't been able to answer the question to myself, but you know, those are some of the things that, that, that come to mind. Was it the geographics of location between other communities? Was it uh, um, the fact that it was fairly uh, isolated from 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 others uh, was for the the basis for that. Uh, just what what was going on in our ancestors' minds to establish or to our 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 elders, the people that have been here before us, that to establish that area uh, for that that purpose. Um, and you know, uh, I, I've been to several areas far. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but further west, uh, just south of Ajo, uh, uh, there's there's some pretty significant uh, uh, areas out there with some extremely large uh, hohokam uh, uh, significance, whether it's charts of, of pottery, whether it's uh, uh, petroglyphs, whether it's, uh, uh, um, you know, all over the place out there. And, um, you know, we have been going out there with the, uh, with the uh, um, person in charge of the, the forest uh, area out there on a couple of occasions. And uh, it's sad to see, again, there, the desecration that is going on by the border patrol because they don't understand or they understand and don't care of the significance that those areas have and the fact that you know you you're walking uh, in a large area and you're you're literally able to see um, remnants of of our ancestors on on the ground out there. And you're literally able to see a whole area, and I think there's probably at least a half a football field of, of, of lava rock out there that has, has all sorts of uh, uh, writings on, on the rocks. Yeah. And so for me to be able to see things like that, I, I, the, 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 the question in mind comes to, you know, starts coming to mind, what does that particular thing mean? What is that? design mean? What does that writing mean? Why did we just have this significant area of, uh, of rock writings and, and, and uh, uh, pottery shards and, and other things in this, you know, half a football field area? And it's not significant around that. You know, what was the, what was the meaning for that? You know, was that a ceremonial area, you know, and and you know, there's another area um, um, further south of uh, right along the border, um, where there is uh, an area where our elders used to go for ceremony, um, and um, you can literally see same the same thing, you know, as far as remnants of our of our ancestors in that area, but more closer to to Chumama, you know, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I think it's good that that uh, the decision was made to limit uh, the public's access to to areas. I think that that's good because um, you know I was up there probably during my term as the as the vice chairman, that's you know, probably one of the first times I went up there with our Tribal Cultural Affairs Committee. And uh, uh, at that time, you could, you could literally see 
remnants of our people, our ancestors, uh, in several er several areas on that hill. And uh, today, you don't see much of that anymore. And so, you know, I think that that somehow uh, we need to continue to do what is necessary to uh, protect those kinds of things, to protect that history, to protect the the the, the fact that our ancestors have lived here uh, since time immemorial, and that their 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 footprint is here. And for those kinds of 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 um, artifacts or our remnants or shards or or whatever um, really need to be we have a, a responsibility i think every single one of us has a responsibility to to protect that as much as possible and uh, you know you can you can uh, i remember there was a time when i was up there you can literally see this i don't see that anymore this many years later such you know i often say that you know someone can erase thousands of years of history in a few minutes by, by such mm -hmm. actions. And, and what you talk about is such a balance, um, you know, at the, at the same time in limiting the access to the top of the hill as, as you referred to, there, you know, was the kind of that ripple effect talking about earlier was I think for many of uh, them, uh, you expressed this to me as well, a feeling of, uh, exclusion and you, you shut us out from our ancestors <laughs> <laughs> right like yeah you know that that there was that and, and and then the the disconnect of you know that that's the exact opposite intention of the of the move but without that connection without that communication and that, that reciprocal understanding it does it, that's exactly what it is it's excluding everything um right and, and you know it, it was, uh, and I think I shared this with you when, when those those cable barriers were were put up. You know, I used to like the fact that I could continue to walk beyond those those cable barriers and and feel the presence of our of our of our creator and feel the presence of our ancestors in in seeing uh, remnants of their of their existence there. Um, and so when the barriers were put up, um, I mean, I try to, I try to obey the rules as best as possible. And so I, I don't go beyond them. Um, but, you know, I think that was, I think for some that was, um, I think for some that was offensive and that was, um, uh, a disconnect mm -hmm. for, for some of us that, that know the significance of that area, know the significance of the cultural significance of that area, that will go there and respect that and know how to respect it, but to want to be able to access that because they feel the presence of, of the spiritual presence of that area when they do go back that way. Absolutely. And yeah, and, and so related to that, you know. When we think about the modern day use of the space, you know, what is your understanding of the connection as and as we're talking about the perhaps the lack thereof um, between Atom and Trimamak? Well, I, I, I my limited knowledge um, of that, you know, is is I don't I don't feel that we 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 make enough effort or spend enough uh, attention to making sure that the autumn understand, know, and are educated, understand the significance of, of uh, that hill to, to us as a people. And I think that, that, that it's important uh, through this, maybe this kind of a, of a, of a presentation or to be able to um, um, put the word out or get the message out there or maybe uh, hold uh, schedule uh, seminars or, or sessions like this specific for uh, and, and maybe much more culturally significant to uh, an autumn audience, uh, young audience. You know, I just recently this past Monday 
participating in uh, indigenous, indigenous People's Day at, um, on the football field at Choya High School. Mm. And Choya High School is immediately south of, right. of the hill. And I did this last year as well, but I did that again this year in talking to both students uh, and adults that were, that were attending. I, I, I impressed on them that, you know, our people have been here, our ancestors have been here uh, forever since time immemorial. And uh, I pointed to Chimamak, I pointed to the hill and I says, how many of you understand the significance of that hill to us as a people? I would encourage you to learn about that. I would encourage you to read it, to understand it. And I strongly encourage you to, to go up there, you know, to walk. But you better be prepared for a good workout when you do go up there. Um, but I encourage you to do that because you can, you know, you, with the right mindset, with the right reasons, you can, you can literally feel the strength of that mountain uh, once you get to the top. And once you begin to understand uh, that and so I, I share that with this 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 young audience last year, and I shared that again today. And then after that session, and we were ending, and this young man, I, he's probably about uh, 14, 15 years of age. He said, "I just want you to know that I was here last year, and I heard you talk about that, and I did go. I did, I did go. I says, oh great, did you make it to the top?' He says, "No, but I will next time." Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I think it's those opportunities that you, we impress, we have to impress in our own people the, 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 the significance of some of these places and, and help us understand our own history as a people. Because sometimes we don't, we don't uh, sometimes that's not uh, taught to us in the way that you would uh, in, in, in all of them culture or any other native culture. One of the things that we've been working on a lot and, and, and reflecting on is, is, again, the university stewards and managers of the spaces, one, making that connection, addressing the gap of knowledge, being able to answer the questions of, you know, from Atam and other Native peoples. Am I welcome there? Is there are, the, are the buildings allowed? To, am I allowed to go in there? Am I allowed to walk up? And starting there, and the answer is absolutely yes but then finding the conduits to, to communicate that. And I think one of the challenges I, I personally feel is a lot of times our conduits can be overly bureaucratic and like formal, right? Like where you enter, you've got to make an email to ask permission. It's like, you know, I'm here physically walking, you know, and there's no one directly. How, how can we bridge that gap? And I just think it's a, a, it's a, it's a process, um, but it starts with being as welcoming as possible, but striking that balance of uh, again, I, 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 I focus on the word stewardship of, of, of present maintenance of the space and the cultural history, but, but actually but continuing that history to be the present day, which, which is, is very vibrant still as well. You know, oh, go on if you were gonna say something. No, I was just gonna say that, you know, uh, uh, the University of Arizona is a government. Right. The Donatham Nation is a government. And sometimes we instill processes that sometimes defeat some of the purposes that we want that we want to make available. Yeah, which is really unfortunate. Um, but you know, um, I, I sometimes I say sometimes we are our own worst enemies. Yeah. You know, when we when we create policies or 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 regulations that um, limit or that prohibit our own people from accessing uh, and, and being able to access places like, like Chumamak or, or other areas. And it's a, it's a process to find the, the conduits within and the processes. Yeah. You know, speaking of the, the vibrancy, it, it's been, something that's been shared with me is, you know, the sense of home or connection that Chumamak provides Atom. Um, when Lisa Palacios was speaking with us and in, in the spring lecture series we had on the cultural landscape of Chumamak Tuag that unfortunately got curtailed. Uh, she said that Chumamak represents a, a point of connection, a, a sense of home. And I was wondering if you, if you may be able to kind of relate or expand on that. 
Well, I have to uh, say that uh, Lisa Palacios, if she hasn't accomplished that already, soon to be Dr. Lisa Palacios, a, a member of, of my tribe, a member of the Tonawata Nation, um, has really dedicated a lot of her, her effort in archaeology and understanding, you know, these kinds of things. And so um, I, I think that she puts it succinctly, you know, that places like Chumamak or Chumamak itself is a place that we can, that we feel home, that we feel at home, at home uh, like, you know, whenever you go to your home, you feel that the, 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 the strength of your, your home, of your being there. Um, well, being up on Chimamak, for many people, or I would hope many all of them, would also recognize that this is home. This is home, and this is the home of our ancestors, and we are descendants of, of the Hohokam. And so that ties us, that ties us, that brings our relationship, our ties to that home. And so we, we, we need to see it that way and we need to respect that area as we would respect and take care of our own home. Thank you. Yeah, well, very well said. So I'm, if you would, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind helping me see Chomomak from, from your eyes as you walk up and down. Um, so I guess this connection kind of, this question connects to one of the things that's been really, I just feel like I've been immersed in since you know, stepping in as director here is the multiple perspectives that can, that are lenses that can be had upon this landscape, all coexisting in time and space. Um, so for example, I, I came of age in the sciences and uh, connected to this space and Chumamak or Tumamak Hill as home of the desert laboratory. And I kind of fixated on the buildings, right? The, the, the birthplace of the science of ecology, desert ecology, um, the best known, longest studied saguaro populations in the world and so on and so forth. And one of the things that's honestly been surprising and, and the most rewarding aspect I feel of, of, of many rewarding aspects of, of this position is that my mind has been expanded so much on the human side, on the cultural side, on, on that, no, this is a cultural, a human landscape first, upon which a laboratory was placed a hundred, you know, thousands of years into the narrative. Um, and it, it, it's, feel, and I continue to be in awe of, of the true timeline and cultural connections here. But I'm just curious, as, as you walk up and down the hill, you know, what do you, if you don't mind me just sharing specific plants you may observe or views or a feeling or, you know, I think it's different for each of us, but I, I would just really appreciate some glimpses into how you interact with the space. Well, one of the things that that is obviously very significant um, is the presence of, uh, of uh, how do you call it uh, in English, the creosote. Mm -hmm. The uh, sugar, as we call it, the sugar, mm -hmm. and and for for all of them, the sugar, the the creosote bush, you know, has a significant meaning to us because it is used uh, uh, for for healing purposes. It can be used to uh, to boil uh, to help um, the the steam, you know help heal your your bad cold or whatever the case may be um you know there's 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 purpose and i know that uh many of our of our medicine folk use uh, uh use the shukai the, the creosote bush in their their healing practices um i know that when i was pretty sick my the the, the medicine person gave me some some uh, dried uh, uh, shikai uh, creosote bush and, and said you know uh, just burn some of this and, and take in the smoke 
and it will it will help you you as you continue to heal. And uh, you know, I, I see there's obviously an abundance of that uh, there, and as you walk up, and you know, every now and then you just kind of I'll just walk by and I'll just touch the touch the the creosote because I I feel the significance of that particular bush to uh, to us as a people. I know that some folks will take a take a little bit of it and put it in their pocket or put it in their on their person somewhere because they they feel that that helps um, helps them as they they journey up and they journey down. Um, you know, I, I I like I shared. I, I see a you know a, a lot of uh, a lot of dough, uh, and right now, and you know, I guess it's the season of the year because. You know, for summertime, they 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 all left, right. and uh, about two weeks ago, uh, maybe three weeks ago, on my walk down, um, I ran into a couple of, of fawns, some some baby deer, and I don't know, they they were not very old, and there was two of them, and uh, I was looking around to see where the mom was, the doe uh, the, the doe was, and I only saw one doe. And so uh, what that told me was that she was the mother and the two were twin, twin fawns. Mm -hmm. And that is a blessing. You know, the fact that the doe was there and the fawns were there were a blessing, but to be able to see twin does, you know, at the same time was, was, was a, a, a double blessing. And, uh, uh, so there's there's that I've run into uh, some Gila monster uh, on the side of the side of the road there. Um, not too many snakes, although I'm sure there are quite a few snakes. But uh, 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 some of the snakes will 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 be crossing the road. And you know, one of the things that I think some people realize and some people don't um, is this is their home. You know, this is where they forage and this is this is a important uh, home for them and we are just uh, you know by doing this walk we're kind of invading their space and you know some folks will will stop and will wait till they cross the road and some other folks will won't even give it a second thought I just continue to walk on by and you know and scare them or whatever the case may be but but uh, you know those are those are some of the things that I see. I, I, uh, you know, a lot of these little uh, little insects I call them. There's a lot of little. Uh, I think it was during the rainy season. There were some of these little tiny, bright red or or orange uh, uh, insects. I don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. um, the mites, uh -huh. And then the 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 caterpillars, you know, crossing along the 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 the, the path there. And this year, it seemed like there was a, a, an abundance of butterfly. Mm -hmm. I think more butterfly this year than I've seen in years past. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, uh, and then, you know, you recognize the, 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 the time of the year, say come end of May, 1st of June, when the, when the saguaro fruit, uh, the, we call it the bahidech starts to to bloom and starts to prepare itself, and um, you know you see see a lot of that going on there. You know sometimes I wish that I had uh, what we call the kui, but the the stick to pull down some of those some of those uh, fresh uh, uh, saguaro fruit, just because uh, you know uh, they're good. They're good. This year you didn't have to. There was so much fruit just all around for a couple of weeks. My goodness, it was just everywhere. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I know I am, and I'm sure many of you at home um, are nodding, right? And I think these shared observations, I, I hope many of you, if you've been walking the hill, have, have seen the fun. So it, it, it truly is a blessing that mom was up on the top of the hill. I saw her uh, in the middle of the summer, quite pregnant. And uh, and then the next um, was with, with her two babies. And, and yeah, it's and really, you know, I feel like they, as you say, they welcome it us into their lives. It's amazing how much they share the space with us. Um, 
I want to make sure this has been such a rich conversation it, it, uh, to make sure to get some questions in from the audience here. Um, so, so Chairman, I'm just going to kind of go in here. We've got some great questions to start. So first from um, Adriana Zuniga is, uh, thank you so much for sharing your experience, Chairman Norris. The, the way you speak about your time, the time you spend on Tumamak Hill, it seems that you are meditating with your eyes open and doing this while climbing the hill. You speak about reflection, contemplation, praying, remembering ancestors, and thinking positive thoughts for you and others. Do you think climbing the hill could be a special kind of meditation? Most definitely. If, if, if what I do is meditating, then it is. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, I got to have it once with it's like, um, if you... So I was trying to practice meditation. I don't think I'm ever going to do it. And it's like, no, that, that's what, exactly what you're doing right now. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm able to do it. Yeah, we each find our own forms of meditation or what you describe. Mm -hmm. I think many of us experience that here. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, so this is from Michael Brewer. Uh, great talk and great conversation. And explanatory sign at the level near the buildings, one of the signs we have. Um, as an example of restoration ecology. Um, do either of you have anything to say about restoration ecology specifically can be elaborated on um, in terms of restoration because it's an example of healing. So, so perhaps thinking about restoration at the landscape level. And if, if Chairman, if you have any examples of, of that um, in, in any level or specifically that we can relate it here at Chumala. Well, you know, I, uh, I I think that yes, we have to be concerned about the level of restoration um, in this area and other areas similar to this because, you know, when when you all started the renovations in some of the buildings there and and you tore down what I I think was a storage mm -hmm. or a, an old garage building type there and and I think uh, the uh, I'm assuming it's a it's a, a water a water tank to 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 take in some of the the right. rainwater um, there, you know when I when I, I I started to see that kind of of I'll call it construction activity going on, and when there's a lot of activity uh, like that going on up uh, on there, I start to think about you know I hope that there's not. I hope we're not taking away or we're, I hope we're not adding to uh, what's already taken away the, the view, the atmosphere, the, 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 you know, what's there. I mean, what, what is there is there. You know, the buildings that were there are there. I just hope that we don't turn it into um, any more buildings and any more areas that would uh, take away the site and take away um, um, the beauty mm -hmm. that we see there. Yeah. You know, the, I think that's, um, may I just re maybe reflect on that question a bit. I think there's a dichotomy, almost maybe perhaps a paradox in, in, in how we think about restoration, right? In one sense, there was the restoration ecology pr approach of fencing the 860 acre parcel property, right? To exclude cattle, to allow um, that perhaps damage caused by the cattle to release the landscape from that for then understand dynamics of desert systems and for sciences, right? But that same act of restoration also created exclosure, right? And the fencing of the property, that very act. And then the establishment of the laboratory buildings. And, and really at that time, I think it was a direct beginning of a period of time of much less use by people and, and certainly much less used by Ottoman and for cultural reasons. And so there, that, that there's, the, there's a real piece, I think, of paradox and uh, going in opposite directions there of that history of restoration, um, which hopefully is efforts that, to your point, Chairman, that we're working to not go in such diametrically opposed directions, but to have restoration be a more holistic and, and united effort. The, um, there was a question here, and maybe I can all take the first crack at it, and then 
I would feel free to answer as well, Chairman. The, the trend regarding ownership, land ownership here physically of the Hill, um, I think ownership is a very loaded word, but I'm going to address it kind of a, from the legally perspective of, of deeds and rights and leases and so forth. So the, um, the 860 acre parcel I just mentioned is uh, legally owned by two uh, agencies. One is the University of Arizona, which is where the laboratory, where I'm talking to you from, and the hill proper. And then off to the west, there's another about 300 acres of land of the flats that is um, owned by the Pima County and was part of, they acquired it from the state, Arizona State Land Trust in 2009 internet at auction um, for part of their open space conservation plan is the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. Immediately to our east is, uh, and actually on the eastern slope of Chimowoc, it begins the parcel of land of Sentinel Peak Park or a mountain park, which is city of Tucson. So it's city of Tucson, University of Arizona, and then Pima County. And I guess, Chairman, I'm just maybe the, 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 a, a, a can of worms perhaps there in terms of the, but one thing that I've seen is there's often not even much communication amongst those three entities I just shared. We're doing pretty well with the county, the city at times better than others. Is there, what level do you engage in your position with the university? And, 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 and does Tumamak fold into that much at all in your experience? Well, you know, there was a, um, I think it was probably in the early 1970s. Um, and obviously it was years even before then in the making that uh, the Thonaut Nation settled its land claims uh, for all of our ancestral lands, uh, including where the city of Tucson sits today and pretty much um, that area that you're talking about and, and, and Tucson and so on. And uh, I think it was in 1970, 76, 75, somewhere around there, uh, that that settlement finally, finally uh, was taken care of. And uh, as a result of that settlement, it's my understanding that um, um, the, the Papago tribe at that time, that's who, what we were called, the Papago tribe of Arizona, uh, forever gave up any right or title to uh, any of the land that was uh, determined to be in the, in the land settlement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it makes it as, it makes it kind of interesting now because uh, this many years later, you know, we are so much more uh, understanding of who we are in our ancestral areas and our, our whatever rights that we may have, may have uh, and may still be entitled to. And so um, I think that, that as long as we can uh, and, and continue to communicate, continue to have a, a shared understanding with the governmental entities, whether that be the University of Arizona, whether that be uh, uh, the city of Tucson, uh, Pima County, um, uh, whatever the case may be, that as long as we can, and I, and I think we do, have a very, um, uh, ha have an open mind and a willingness to understand um, that regardless of that settlement, um, there are still um, connections to these areas for many of our, many of us, for many of our people. And so we need to keep that line of communication open with those three governmental entities. We need to be able to work with each other to, and in hopes that we can come to some level of mutual understanding of how we might want to, um, address issues of common concern. Uh, example, um, and I've shared this with, with uh, county folks and I've shared this with uh, uh, city officials that 
you know, there was a time uh, when the late uh, Richard Elias, Richard Elias and I spent a lot of morning breakfasts together at Rigos uh, in South Tucson. It's no longer open anymore. Um, but uh, he was such an, an awesome uh, individual, an awesome human being. Uh, and understood a lot of a lot of what we're talking about today, and uh, you know we had talked about how do how how can we work together to continuously preserve what's left of Chumamak? How can we ensure that that area is protected? You know, and those were the we didn't get anywhere with it, but we've had those conversations, and I think that that. I would hope that the three entities, the city, the state, uh, the city, the county, and the university uh, would be open to having those kinds of conversations to, because I'm sure you're concerned about protection, protecting that area. The city is, I'm sure, and the, and the county is. Um, you know, it's, it's just, but how can we do that together? What do we need to do to help each other accomplish the protection of this area because it has a huge significance to the history of not only the, the whole come to our ancestors but also to the city and the county and the university for that matter yeah i i mean i mean taking a step further as another example and it's something that we're working towards and we've spoken about this and i think it connects to the question about restoration this is, to me is an example of forward thinking restoration which is the in many ways, I think and it's to me, it's kind of the elephant in the room when thinking about Chumamak, it's the radio towers at the top of the hill and, and that presence, um, the, that's a huge issue. Um, but one element is that on the south side of the top of the hill, much of that infrastructure is defunct, is derelict, is not serving a purpose anymore. And, and it is my direct intention to work with all the partners to be to remove a lot of the infrastructure in the way that makes the most sense, but to start to heal that space. And I think that we've spoken to the university leadership. There's definitely some interest there, but it's continuing to have those comrades. We lost our, that champion in, in Richard, um, but to, there's other leaders in our community that are part of this and it's continuing to push in that direction. And, and to me, that's maybe the next most direct visible step we can make together. Another question here is, um, is from, from Mary Price says, thank you, Chairman Norris, for sharing your relationship with Chumawak. It's, it's beautiful and I find it's sad that so many who engage with the Hill have a much less deep relationship with it. Um, do you have any thoughts on how the rich spiritual power of Chumawak can be more widely shared? Wow. Um... I, I, I really don't. I mean, we can talk about it. We can share these spiritual experiences. We can, um, you know, do that on a, on, a, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, but it's really up to the individual. Mm -hmm. It's up to the individual, in my opinion, that is going, to, is going to determine whether or not that spiritualness or the strength of that spiritualness that you can that you feel that you can feel uh, of Chumama um, is 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 really up to the individual themselves. I mean, we can talk about it, we can talk with each other, we can share our experiences with each other, but uh, you and your own mind, in your own heart, in your own spiritualness are going to have to determine what does that mean to you. Am I feeling the same? And you know, maybe uh, maybe not right away, but uh, maybe it'll maybe you'll experience something there that'll that'll say, ah, oh, that's what we're talking about. One thing that comes to mind is is um, a project that we're embarking on, and and Trim, I don't think I've shared this with you before. That this is. It's maybe a step in that direction to Mary's question is that we're have begun conversations with neoglyphics and an aerosol um, indigenous arts co collective co collaborative group started at the university uh, that creates um, multiple artists um, doing spray paint of art, beautiful work. And we've engaged in the conversation of perhaps 
this is kind of the current working idea is having the name Chimama in Atom, each letter being a kind of particle board, very large, you know, six feet or so, multiple sides, taking each letter, dispersing them up and down the hill, having each artist kind of tell their own story on that letter rel related to the themes of the hill from their perspective and being, you know, kind of a live arts piece, engaging people on the hill, have that present. And then over time, then assembling the letters together at a point on the hill where it spells Chimamak together. And then each letter is bringing that whole story together. Um, that that's been a fun project that, that I, I think starts to get right different cracks at, at addressing these different layers we're talking about. Sure. Well, we're, I think the one last question from the audience and then, and then I'll have a kind of a, maybe a parting question for you, Chairman. Um, this is from Carolyn Lujan who, who asks if you'd be um, willing to elaborate on the sacredness of, of saguaros. Well, um, the elders tell us that uh, the saguaros should be looked at as our elder, our elder brothers. Um, you know, the, the, the saguaro have been here, geez, forever. And we have used the fruit of the saguaro um, for various reasons, whether it's harvesting the the bahi vetch, the saguaro, and the saguaro fruit, and and making syrup or making jam out of it, or just eating it raw the way it, the way it is, but also the 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 syrup can be fermented, and when it can be fermented, it turns into a wine type of a of a of a, of a drink. And uh, during the, the times where we can, where we have rain, uh, rain ceremonies, um, the, the fermented syrup is used in rain ceremonies. And obviously uh, rain is good. Uh, rain replenishes a lot of, of the vegetation that is there. And, Without water, without rain, you know, we we wouldn't be where we're at. We wouldn't we wouldn't survive without that. And so, the saguaros have that level of significance to us as an elder brother would, and we 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 should respect that saguaro, those saguaros in that way, to recognize that. Uh, they have been here for a long time, but they also give life, give fruit, give meaning to uh, who we are as a people when we harvest it and when we start using uh, the vegetation off of the soil. Beautiful. And well, quite a, a display and, and abundance of resources they shared with us this year now. Um, maybe as a parting question, Chairman, I, I just, um, if you, what would you invite people walking Chumamak to do or see differently as they continue on their journeys? Listen to your heart. Listen to what you're feeling as you walk the hill. You know, I, I, I walk and I all have my pods on and, you know, I'll be listening to other things as I'm walking up the hill, but that doesn't distract me from the environment that I'm witnessing as I walk up that hill. And uh, I think that, that if you can begin to realize or to visualize or to feel what the environment that you're that you're in and, and, and try to bring your mindset towards you know since years back since the years of the first uh, human beings the the, the whole come that 
that lived there and, and wonder how they survived in such uh, arid, you know, land land bases and so on and so forth. Um, I think that that helps you to to really begin to appreciate um, the walk even more, to be able to appreciate the fact that you can feel um, uh, the environment, you can feel um, nature, you can witness um, the natural things that are, are on your journey when you walk up. But also think about um, How, how, what it took for others, what it took for our ancestors to get up there. You know, as I understand it, um, you know, that, that village was identified some uh, 2,500 years ago up on top of the hill. And then for some reason, I think it was in 1,500 years ago, 1,500 years ago, uh, the, the village was abandoned. And, and the, the, the Hohokam left that, that village and went where? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't read up enough about it to know that. And you probably know yourself, Ben. I'm sure you understand what, what the history is there. But the reason I'm, I'm bringing it up is because once that, that the, the, you know, 2,500 years ago when there was a village there, and then 1,500 years ago when it was, when it was abandoned, it still remained a place of ceremony. It still remained a place for, for, for our ancestors to go to, to do ceremony, to have ceremonies. Um, and, and so uh, uh, I think that if, if, you, if you're gonna walk up, I would hope that you would look at what you're looking at and feel what you're feeling from that perspective. I think it, 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 it adds to your ability to deal with the spirituality or the spiritualness of, of experiencing uh, the walk up Chivama. So well said. Thank you. Thank you for your time and for joining us. This has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you to your audience, to the audience. Thank you for the questions and uh, Maybe I'll see you up that hill next time we're up there. I look very forward to it. Chairman, thank you for your leadership and, and uh, we'll hope to see you soon. To everyone that joined us, thank you for being part of this. Um, and we'll connect uh, to you next month. We're gonna be uh, digging into very similar themes, but really trying to dig deeper into the understanding of connection between people in this space um, from the, the vast numbers of people that, that walk here. So. Good night, Chairman. Again, thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.